using the same analogy to hydraulics that we used when describing the resistors, inductors can be described as a water mill. A water mill has a continuous current flowing through it, so it's turning constantly and it can increase its speed. That would mean the current flow, the liquid flow would speed up as can the electrical current in an inductor, but it cannot jump. It cannot go from one speed to another speed abruptly. It has an inertia and that one would rise steadily, but cannot make any jumps. The water pressure over a water mill can cause the rise or also the decrease of the speed of the water mill and equivalently the voltage across an inductor can increase the electrical current flowing through it or decrease it if it is changing abruptly. But the current cannot change abruptly, the voltage can. An abrupt change of current would mean that the water mill would stop abruptly. So you, for example, you put a stick into the water mill and then either the stick or the water mill itself would break. And the same holds for inductors in the electrical equivalent. Now let's investigate the physics behind inductors. First of all, I would like to define the nomenclature. The variables defined on the right-hand side here are used in Faraday's induction law and in Ampere's law on the left-hand side. The number of turns shows up in both of them. In Faraday's induction law, the number of turns times the magnetic flux is equal to the integral of the voltage over time. So for example, taking a piece of wire, piece of copper, any conductive material, typically it would be copper, and wind it up a couple of times, we get the number of windings. Here I have an example of four windings on that piece of cable. Now, if I apply a voltage on the end of those cables here, so assuming my, my hand here is an AC voltage source with, for example, four volts of amplitude, could be a sinusoidal voltage source. So that would be four volts times a sinusoidal waveform. And we have four windings here. That means we have one volt per turn on this cable here. The magnetic flux created by this construction would be the exact same if I would have five turns here and if I would apply five volts across the ends of the conductor. Now, before we can speak about flux density and the magnetic field, we need to define the effective cross-section of the magnetic field and the effective length of the magnetic field. I have shown you these conductors with the voltage source applied across them. That means we would generate an AC current inside these loops here. Now the AC current flowing in the conductor, the white cable, the loops here, would generate a magnetic field perpendicular to the direction of the white cable and all the way around it. The longest loops are the ones that go straight through the middle, the center of the white cable here. Whereas we also have shorter loops, which are closer to the conductor and the magnetic field lines represented by the red cable here would have a shorter length. And that's all the way around the conductor. Now the effective length of the magnetic field is one measure, one distance only to represent all of these red magnetic field lines here. From that analogy here, you can easily imagine that you can fit in weighs more of the smaller ones because they are on the outside of the circle of the white loops than the inner ones that are further away. Now we first generated an AC current in that wire by applying an AC voltage across it. 
then we derived a representation for the effective length of the magnetic field by the length of the red wire here. Now taking the conductor totally out of the picture and only leaving the representation of the magnetic field here, this is the one that is giving us the area, the effective cross-section of the magnetic field. And again, we have various fields. We have the smaller ones that have been all the way around our conductor, and we have the longer ones in the middle. So that means we end up getting different diameters of our magnetic field, and that is the one that determines at the end the effective magnetic field area. It has nothing to do with the area of our conductor. Now taking this knowledge into account, we can relate the magnetic flux to the effective cross-section of the magnetic fields and derive the magnetic flux density from that. The magnetic flux is coupled to the voltage and remembering from Maxwell's equations in physics that the voltage is coupled to the electrical field, we can see the connection between the magnetic and the electrical field here. But for now, let's focus on the magnetic laws. Inserting also the number of turns from equation number 20 and carrying on the effective cross-section of the magnetic field from the denominator in the first step of equation 21, we can solve this equation towards the voltage being the number of turns times the effective cross-section of the magnetic field times the time derivative of the magnetic flux density. This is widely known as Faraday's induction law. Now, Ampere's law is a mathematical formulation of the discovery of the electromagnetism from Hans Christian Oerster. It says that the number of turns multiplied by the current running in an inductor is equivalent to the length integral from zero to the effective length of the magnetic field lines of the magnetic field across that length. So on the left-hand side of the equation, we have our white conductors. We have the number of turns in the conductor and the current running through it. And on the right-hand side of the equation, we have the magnetic field represented by the red wire in the field lines and the length of it. Furthermore, the strength of that magnetic field, which could be represented by the thickness of this piece of wire. Now also solving this equation for an electrical variable, which is the current in this case, we end up having the electrical current in the conductor being defined as the length integral of the magnetic field divided by the number of turns. For a time-dependent current and a time-dependent voltage, we can represent an inductor by the symbol shown down here. Now we can apply Ohm's law to that inductor. That means the voltage integral over time divided by the current is the inductance. In the previous slide, we have derived an equation for the voltage from the physical laws, and we have derived an equation for the current based on the magnetical field. Bringing these two together through Ohm's law results in the definition of the inductance. We can simplify the vectors B and H as well as the remaining integral for assuming homogeneous and linear materials. A linear material means it behaves the same way no matter how much current you force through the conductor or how much voltage you apply across it. Homogeneous means that the magnetic material behaves the same way no matter at which point in the geometry we are looking at.
in terms of air, as we had by the representation of our magnetic field, somewhere in the air here, this is a very fair assumption. But having the magnetic field inside a magnetic material, that could be very different. For now, we assume that all the magnetic field lines are going through a homogeneous material. That means that the magnetic field represented by a red wire here meets the same magnetic properties all the way around its path. Note that magnetic field lines need to be closed lines. Analytically, that means that the ratio of the magnetic flux density divided by the magnetic field can be represented by the permeability mu of a material together with the geometrical sizes of the magnetic field, the effective cross-section and the effective length. This results in the so-called AL value, which represents the material used for constructing an inductor. At the end, the inductance is scaled by the number of turns squared. The AL value therefore represents all the magnetic behavior of a magnetic material, including its geometry. Physicists often use the reciprocal value of the AL value and call that reluctance. Finally, the physical definition of the inductance is summed up here. And for a practical engineering use, it is often abbreviated down to the AL value times the number of turns squared. Combining this knowledge with the knowledge on signals that we have learned previously, we can freely define the inductor current. So here I'm defining the inductor current to be a cosinusoidal waveform with the phase phi and an amplitude of IL. Applying Ohm's law to that inductor leads to the voltage across it, which is the inductance times the time derivative of the current that we have just defined in the equation above. The time derivative of a cosine is a sinusoidal waveform with a minus in front of it. Furthermore, we need to multiply the derivative of the argument of the cosine wave which is a linear function of time. So the phi goes out and from omega t, omega stays as a multiplication factor of the original derivative of the outer function. We carry on the inductance from the left-hand side of this equation from over here and IL, the amplitude of the current stays as a further multiplication factor. Now we can always rewrite the minus sine wave as a cosine wave by changing its phase. So taking also into account that we had the minus in front of here, that leads to the exact same equation as we had above when defining the current with a phase shift of plus 90 degrees. Rewriting the current with Euler's equation we end up with the real part of the Euler's equation, so the cosinusoidal waveform only, and can use our phase annotation to express the same signal. Now, practically, you would only write down the phaser down here and remove everything else that is not part of the phaser for further investigations. But here, I would like to show you one more time how it relates to the original signal in the time domain. Applying Ohm's law also in the phase of domain leads to the derivative of the exponential functions. And the only one that is time dependent is the e part by j omega t. Taking the time derivative of that one leaves the original e part by j omega t and the time derivation of the argument leads to the multiplication of the factors j omega in front of the equation. All the other factors are time independent and we just carried on from the left-hand side of the equation. 
we can rewrite the imaginary number j as e powered by plus 90 degrees. And finally combine it with the phase of our voltage phaser. That means the voltage across our inductor in the time domain has an amplitude of omega times the inductance times the inductor current. And exactly the same factor shows up for the amplitude in the phase of domain. Furthermore, the phase in the time domain is the original phase of the current V. And then the voltage is offset by plus 90 degrees. Also showing up down here in the phaser domain as the argument of the phaser. Note again that the operation of the real part in the E powered by J omega T is not part of the phaser and then therefore not included in the curly brackets down here. We can see the advantage of the phase annotation if we compare the time domain notation that we need for the voltage, the current, and the impedance of an inductor up here in equation 26 with the same amount of information written down here in the phaser domain in equation 29. Furthermore, the impedance of an inductor can be simplified to the set with the underscore and an index L, which is equivalent to J times omega L. Now note that a multiplication in the phaser domain with J omega is equivalent to the time derivative in the time domain. Now we have previously chosen the inductor current as a cosinusoidal waveform with an amplitude of IL and an arbitrary phase phi, which relates to the time axis down here. In the phaser diagram, that phase shows up for the phaser of the inductance compared to the real axis. Through Ohm's law, we could derive the voltage amplitude across the inductor, as well as a phase shift between voltage and current of exactly 90 degrees. Those 90 degrees show up in our phaser diagram by the 90 degree angle down here. And in terms of inductors, the voltage vector is 90 degrees ahead of the current vector. The length of the voltage vector over here corresponds to the height of the amplitude of the sinusoidal waveform in the time domain and the angles are represented by the phase shifts in the time.